Good morning, everybody. I was going to see if you catch that. Just say good morning. Some, some people didn't matter. They said, yeah, good morning. It's good to have everybody back this evening. We're going to pick up in Judges. I thank Ken. He did a fine job last week uh, taking us through Chapter 9. And we're going to pick up in Chapter 10 uh, tonight and try to go through a few chapters. Uh, we're going to rush through. We only got uh, five more weeks left to go through this. And uh, so we're going to get back to some of the darkness. One of the things I want you to take note of in this chapter, as you'll see here, if I can cut it on. You see, we've talked about all these judges so far, Ophniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon. And tonight we're going to talk about Tola and Zer and Jephthah and maybe its band if we get that far. Now, last week, who did we talk about? Nope. Last week, who did we talk about? Huh? Who? Zerubbabel. No. Abimelech. It was Abimelech. He's not listed. <laughs> that wasn't a trick question, by the way. <laughs> and you don't see his name on here because he wasn't a judge. He probably wanted to be one because he solicited that the other tribes would name him to be a ruler, so he wanted to have power. Now, that tells you something, doesn't it? There are many people that want power, but they're not chosen by God or power, and that says something. God chooses who he will choose, and many people try to subvert God and say, I want to have the power. And so God put that in there for a reason. So that to show you that there are people who want power, but God hasn't chosen them. And he met a bad end because of that, okay? Now, when we get back to this one right here, I want you to take notice of something else. Um, this, again, is the map, and we're going to be talking uh, tonight, again, about Tola and Zaire and Jephthah. And Jephthah is right here. And, again, we talked about it before. This is a conglomeration of the nation of Israel, and it was many different judges for many different areas because of the enemy that they were around. And so we're going to have Tola here, Jair here. So they were all over the board after their enemies. And so when we look at that, that's what you want to keep in mind. And also I want to point out to you, the people that God chose, many of them, were people that were unknown. He didn't always choose the biggest and the richest, but he chose those who made themselves because God chose them great. And I, I found it interesting when you look at this map and you see the size of Israel compared to all of the countries around. And God chose them to be his people. Not a large country, a small country that since that time has infiltrated the whole world with their faith and Christianity came out of it, a small country. When you look at it again, you'll see it's about the size of New Jersey. Interesting. That small group of people has such an influence on the whole world. Isn't that amazing? God didn't choose a large nation. When you look at it, God did not choose a large nation. That tells you something. God doesn't need large nations to get his will done. America, God's will will be done no matter what. Look what he says here to Tola and Zaire. And this is interesting, too, because Tola and Zaire, this is just about all that's said about them. Interesting, but they're listed. And after Abimelech, there arose to save Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he lived at Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. And he judged Israel 23 years. Then he died and was buried at Shamir. And after him rose Jair, the Gileadite, who judged Israel 22 years. And he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. And they had 30 cities called Havinoth Jar to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Canaan. That's all that's said about them. It's interesting. He talks about them, and he says here, Jair, he said they rode 30 donkeys. 
Why do you think that's important to list on there, that he rode 30, that his son rode 30 donkeys? Why do you think that's important? Any idea? Donkeys were the animal that you rode when you were royalty. It was not a horse. Horses were used for battle. Donkeys were, were what royalty rose. What did Jesus ride on? A donkey. And there's many scriptures. I didn't get a chance to put them up there. It talks about that example of that. So they rode on how many donkeys? 30. And they had 30 cities. So they were pretty well off. God does use people who are well off. So he has an example of that. I just thought that was interesting when I read that. When, when I read scripture sometimes, I try to, when I look at a verse, I try to look at a verse and say, what five questions can I get out of this verse? Five questions. And I saw a donkey. Why would he list a donkey? Why is that important? He had some wealth to him. So God uses the lowly and he uses the wealthy. That's something I think that we need to know. Go ahead, Rocky. So what can we infer from these two judges? What can we? Well, we got 45 years here that they were not oppressed mm -hmm. by hostile nation. So obviously, it, we can infer their work was involved in keeping Israel out of idolatry. So they, because as soon as they got into idolatry, then God sent an oppressor. So mm -hmm. their work, we can infer their work yep. was more on the spiritual side as opposed to the attacking and reconquering, you know, Mm -hmm. in a physical sense. Yeah, and that's a good point. Uh, think about it. If they were dealing with the spiritual aspect of it, they didn't talk a lot about their lives. The other judges had conflicts in their life. These were men that probably didn't have as many conflicts as worshiping God. So that's a very good point. And they had 45 years of peace. Thank you, Rocky. That's good. That's why this class is so good, because everybody learned something. I even learned something when that happened. Tola and Jair's influence dies with them. According to the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery, the riding of a donkey was a sign of royalty. From the archives dug up in the Babylonian city of Mary, it was learned that the riding of a donkey from entry into a city was an act of kingship. The donkey and the mule were a staple in the Near Eastern royalty ceremonies as well. So that's why they were riding donkeys. What else? Tola and Jair did a fair job of leading the Hebrew people, but Israel immediately did evil upon their deaths. And if it's true what Rocky was saying, even he tried to help them with their spirituality, soon as they died, what did Israel do? They went right back into idolatry. It's hard sometimes to get away, even after 45 years. Remember we talked about a generation of some 30 some odd years? A little bit over a generation, they still went right back into it. So it's not strange that even today, when we see all these people in the world going away from God, that's man's nature. The Bible says what? There is none righteous, no, not one. We all have fallen short, and it's always been that way. So they went right back to serving the gods of Baal, so what kind of leadership did this pair really exert? I may step on a few toes with this. They had leadership that they could take care of things while they were there, but as soon as they died, they went right back to adultery. adultery. And that's the thing that relates with leadership. You have to have a fellowship that wants to continue to follow. It talks about this. If leadership leaves no legacy, it's incomplete. If the people revert to sinful patterns after we depart the scene, we have failed to practice the law of legacy. Remember this. We all want to have leadership that we leave to our families, don't we? We want our children to follow in what we believe in, don't we? We raise them up in the church and we want them to follow the church, but many times they don't. And we could say that's the legacy that we leave, but many times people just choose to do wrong no matter how we rear them, we, they choose to do wrong. When we look at this, the acid test of our leadership takes place after we are gone. Success without a successor is a failure. We want to have success. 
when the leadership here at this congregation is long gone, we would hope and pray that this congregation would still be strong and still be going faithful. But it depends upon who? You. Depends upon your children as it goes strong. The issue isn't can I change them while I'm here, but can I do it after I'm gone? Can I leave a legacy? What legacy are you leaving to your children and to those around you? Reputation is what people think of us now. Legacy is what they think of us long after we're gone. What will be your legacy? Not only at this congregation, but what will be your legacy to your family, to your neighbors, to your friends, to your coworkers? Will they remember you for the stance that you took as serving God and being a rightful person, a person that wants to follow righteousness? A legacy. Thought that was important. Let's look what it says as we continue. Any statements, anybody? Okay, go ahead. You mentioned that you know the part of leadership is legacy. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me that you know the very last few verses of Joshua states that the children of Israel followed Joshua all the days of Joshua mm -hmm. and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. Mm -hmm. So that's a, to your point, a continuation of Joshua's legacy is that the children of Israel continued to serve even after he was gone. That's right. That's a good point. And after time goes on, people tend to wander away. Go ahead, sir. Who replaceable. Mm -hmm. Everybody's replaceable. And if you don't train someone to do what you've been doing after you're gone, that service will not continue. Mm -hmm. Jesus started off his life from day one preparing the disciples for when he was going to no longer be there. That's right. And if we don't do that with our children... You know, how are they going to act when we're not there? And like you said, they will pro they choose to fall away. It's still mm -hmm. going to happen. That's but it. But are you prepared for when they do? Are you preparing them for when they are getting into sin or when they see sin in their lives? Because mm -hmm. they will sin. That's right. We have to rear our children in such a way as that we are replaceable in that sense. And I like what, what, what Mark said. What was the famous statement that Joshua said? He says, as for me and what? My house. We will serve the Lord. Go ahead, Rocky. I noticed that the, the major point of the chapter you're going to study about, but since you brought it up, I, mm -hmm. I, I understand what you're saying, but it, it also has to be balanced, too. Because yeah, people, it does. people have free will, mm -hmm. you know, and so it's often the case that, uh, you know, like Moses, was he a failed leader because people neglected to follow God after he died? Were the apostles, were they failures because? Mm -hmm. Of the, of the gross abandonment of New Testament Christianity that happened after they died. Mm -hmm. So you, you can only go so far with yeah. that. Yes, yes, we need strong leadership in the church and congregations mm -hmm. literally rise above their leadership. So if they've got right. poor leadership, they're not going to go anywhere. That's if right. they got leaders that are not, if they got elders that are not leading them in the truth, then the congregation as a whole is not going to follow the truth. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side of it, yeah, we do need to prepare for after after we die, but the bottom line is people have free will. And people have free will. People will choose to do what they want to do. Yeah, that's true, because even if you look at the book of Kings, you had kings that were righteous, and they had children that were what? Unrighteous. It just happens, because people have free will, and that's a good point. That's why I say people will wax worse and worse. Go ahead, Sam. I have read or heard a few years ago that a family mm -hmm. is one or two generations away from that family falling away from God. Mm -hmm. Because if your children, like you were just saying, if the children are unrighteous, they won't teach their children. Mm -hmm. And then those children will not know the ways of the Lord and the family That's true. legacy yeah. is lost. That's why a generation is so important. We have to stay, we have to rear our children in such a way as they don't turn away from God, or they don't have the desire to turn away from God. But yet the word of God says, you raise up a child in the way they should go. And what? When they are old, they won't depart from it. They may walk away, but somehow something will bring them back because they have that foundation, hopefully and prayerfully. They have that foundation. But many people won't. The Bible says that the majority of people will be lost. And few there be that find the way. 
Okay. All right. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Asterisks. And we, we, we talked about that. It was a very lurid, lurid religion that they had. They had all these prostitutes, which we're going to talk about in, in just a second, because it plays into this. The Asteroths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Amorites, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. They not only got rid of God, they didn't want to serve him. They turned away. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. I like that, and I highlight it because what kindled the anger of the Lord? What kindled it? It tells you right there in the sentence before. They forsook him. What makes God angry? When we forsake God and we turn away from God, that makes God angry. And God's going to do something here because of that. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the Ammonites. And they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years, they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is Gilead. So God was angry with them and God sent tormentors unto them. And for 18 years, they were tormented. And all these years, we could look back and see how long they were tormented. Wouldn't you think that even if they were cognizant of their history, that they would know that they're going to be sold into slavery after doing this for already for five or six judges? When you say, well, hey, we did this before. How can we continue to do this? It's another generation that didn't go through that. And that's why the generations have to pass it on to the other generations. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim so that Israel was severely distressed. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, we have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the balls. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the Ammonites and from the Philistines, from the Zidonites and also the Amalekites and the Mayanites oppress you and you cried out to me and I saved you out of their hand, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. God does come to a point where he says no more. I will save you no more. Go and cry to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. Could those gods save them in the time of their distress? No, because there are no gods. God said, you rely on somebody that's on something that's not a god. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do unto us what seems as good to you. Only please deliver us this day. Do whatever you have to do to save us. We know that we have sinned. Do whatever you have to do. Boy, when you're deep in sin, you'll do anything, won't you? Do whatever you have to do. What could that mean, do whatever you have to do? Many people will die because of it. So they put away the foreign gods from among them, and they served the Lord, and he became impatient over the misery of Israel. God is so good that even when they came back to him after they put away those foreign gods and he said he would not help them anymore, he still became impatient over the, miserable, the misery of Israel, which means he desired to help them because of the misery that they were in. God looks down upon us and he desires to help us because of the lives that we live, because he knows what we're made of, and he desired to help us so much, he sent a Savior, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that we could have an opportunity to eternal life. And it says there that the Ammonites were called to arms, and they encamped in Gilead, and the people of Israel came together, and they encamped in Mitzpah, and I have a map of that in just a second. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said one to another, who is the man who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? 
He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. You know, when you want to get out of sin, you're going to have to fight. When you want to get sin out of your life, you got to fight. Many times we pray to God and we just pray to God that he would just take it away from us. They said, who's going to fight for us? There's going to have to be a fight if you want to get out of sin. You, you can't just say, well, I give it up and that's it. God help me. You're going to have to pay a price. And when you fight, there's a battle, there's a war, and many times lives will be lost because of that. Okay? There's a map there. I hope you can see this. Gilead and Mitzvah, they weren't far apart, probably about two and a half, three miles apart. And so they were getting ready to fight for that little bit of land right there. Whenever I look at maps, I'm always amazed that men all over the world are fighting for land that they can't take with them. They're fighting for all this material wealth and gain that they can't take with them. What's that old joke when Hugh Hefner died? He said, I wonder how much money he left. And someone said, he left a whole of it. <laughs> Couldn't take anything with you, but yet you work all your life and fight all your life. Go ahead, Rocky. Isn't it interesting that at the beginning of this chapter, mm -hmm. he lists all these different countries and the gods that they had and the children of Israel were following after mm -hmm. those gods. Mm -hmm. So you wonder, did they think that by <clears throat> following their gods that somehow that would make them get along better with their nations, other mm -hmm. nations? And yet every time we're seeing in this book, mm -hmm. God is using those very nations whose gods they chose to serve to oppress them. That's it. And isn't that the way it is today? I mean, why do people compromise the truth? Mm -hmm. Because they won't, a lot of times it's because standing against what's wrong is hard. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it causes people not to like you. And so yeah. what do you want to do? You want people to like you so you start doing what they want you to do. That's it. And yet that very thing winds up not helping you in the long run because you're, you're, you're sinning against God and God uses those very people That's that they it. may have been trying to ingratiate themselves to, mm -hmm. to oppress them. Yeah. Sin is never satisfied. Sin is never satisfied. That's the point right there. And the thing is, many times they probably, even though so they put away the Lord, they probably didn't just put him away. They just probably added him to the pantheon of all the other gods. And we'll worship God over here. We'll worship the Zidonian God over here. We'll worship him over here. And sooner or later, they're just worshiping all of these amalgamation of gods. You ever seen those Indian gods that they have? They have those mountains of, 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 of Indian gods, and they have thousands of gods, and they come up with new ones every year. I heard Richard Rogers say one time, he's not amazed when missionaries go over to India and they say, we had 2,000 baptisms. And he said, for many of those Indians, they're just adding Jesus to another one of their gods. You really have to have an understanding of who God is. Thank you, Rocky. That was good. So we go to the next chapter. So now we've gone through Tola. We've gone to Jair. And now we get to Jephthah. He ruled. They were under oppression 18 years and they had rest for six years, not a long time. Again, there's the map there. <clears throat> now, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. Now, I want you to take a look at what his personality is. But he was the son of a prostitute, a harlot. Prostitution was strong then because the, the other religions, they had prostitution involved in there. And so now here comes one where the, 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 his father had had a son by a prostitute. And I think uh, he talked about it last week about how prostitutes and their children were handled. They didn't gain very much respect. So watch what happens. And Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. You're not going to be with us. You're the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. Who did he put himself with? What does it mean when he says worthless fellows? They were criminals. These were roughnecks. 
So Jephthah's out there. He's hanging out there in the world now. But guess what? God's still going to use him. A roughneck person, God's still going to use. But God uses the talents and the attributes that he's gained through all that he's gone through to help his people. So all that we've gone through in life, God's going to use your talents and your attributes to help his people. And after a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. Hold on now. You can't be with us because you're the son of a harlot. We're in trouble now. Who are we going to get? What's that old song? Who are you going to call? You call Jephthah. Jephthah's a bad man if, the, if all of them said we're going to get Jephthah. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? Desperate people do what? Desperate things. That's what it's talking about. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, this is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do as you say. Overcoming a tough start. This is Jephthah. What hope is there for a child born to a prostitute? His, his growing up, his other siblings, half-siblings, threw him out. What hope is there for him? Probably none, because he turned to what? Thievery and whatever he had to do to make a living. He probably had given up hope. Society tends to have low expectations and sometimes downright hostility for people born out of wedlock such as the case in Jephthah, because he was the product of his father's dalliance with a prostitute, Jephthah was not only excluded, but expelled from his more respectable family. Like many rejects, he led the life of a criminal, even though he and his gang may have harassed the Ammonites more than the Israelites. So far as we know, he was just making a living, whether it was Israelites or whether it was Ammonites, he was making a living. So he turned to whatever way he had to make a living. And that's how people live their lives today many times, because of their background. The irony of Jephthah's life was that when Israel faced a war with Ammon, the leaders of his hometown came looking for him to deliver them. They offered no apology. We're sorry we threw you out. Please come back and help us. No, we need you. And they merely appealed for help. To his credit, Jephthah agreed to help after negotiating his terms, and God gave him the victory. He negotiated his terms, and we'll look at that in just a minute. Jephthah's life is a good illustration of the truth that God doesn't judge people on the basis of appearance. He can overcome any background and use any set of circumstances to accomplish his purpose. How many of you know someone that is a roughneck. <laughs> I could tell you stories. <laughs> God can use them. God can save them. But how will God save them? There's a song I like listening to that's called, Who's Gonna Tell Them? You got to tell them. If God's going to use a roughneck person, a person that's had some hard times in their life, the only way God can use them is if they find out about the love of Christ, and that would be through you. You've got to tell them. So don't be afraid to share the gospel with someone that has a harsh background because God may work wonders through that person because of the strength that they have attained through the perseverance of the things they had to go through. They will use that now to tell the story of the love of Jesus Christ. And they probably won't be turned off as much of talking to people as we would be because me, myself, my life hasn't been as hard as some. And maybe because of that, I don't tell the story like I should. But when someone comes from a harsh background, they'll tell the story. 
I've come a long way. And so we shouldn't be afraid to tell that. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all of his words before the Lord at Mitzpah. So he was talking to the Lord. Wow. A roughneck able to talk to God. That says something, doesn't it? it go ahead, Rocky. No doubt he was rejected because he was, mm -hmm. the, his mother was a, was a prostitute. But mm -hmm. when, when you look at the answer that he gives in verse 9, when, when they're calling on him to, to, to lead them against their oppressors, mm -hmm. he says, and the Lord delivered them before me. Mm -hmm. He was already anticipating God doing that. So whatever that happens to mean with the vain fellows following after him, it didn't say that Jephthah went out and rounded up vain people to follow after him. Mm -hmm. But when he was rejected, vain people came after him. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was just the case these were other outcasts that, that followed after him because his response in verse 9 doesn't sound like a, a, a man who who knew nothing about God, who rejected mm -hmm. God, who had yeah. an attitude, because clearly he was he was anticipating, this is only going to happen if God does it, and I'll be the leader. Mm -hmm. to, to me, it almost looks like it's God's providence, and he's, he's using Jephthah as another example of, you rejected me as God, now you want me to help. Well, I'm going to reemphasize that lesson. Here's a person, here's a human being you rejected, and guess what? Mm -hmm. I'm going to use that human being you rejected to get you out of out of the oppression that you brought on yourself. Mm -hmm. to, to me, the, the two story, the two, two the two accounts kind of go hand in hand. Not, yeah. not at all to say Jeff does yeah. anything like God, but the principle there, you know. Mm -hmm. That's it. God uh -huh. uses people, and even though people have to live a life a certain way. Men, what's that old saying? Uh, there's a joke I heard many years ago. It's uh, uh, a person asked the guy to come to worship with him, and the guy said, uh, I don't go to church. He said, there's too many hypocrites in church. Don't go. And the guy looked at him. He said, you know what? All that means is that the hypocrites are closer to God than you are. Hmm. So he was talking to God there. He had some type of background of what God would do for him. back through here. <clears throat> okay, and the king of the Amorites, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Amorites and said, what do you have against me that you have come to me to fight against my land? I, 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 this is amazing. This is a man that's been out in the wilderness and things such as that, fighting things, and now he's talking to kings, telling kings, asking kings questions. And the king of the Amorites answered the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel is coming up from Egypt, took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Now, therefore, restore it peaceably. And Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the Amorites and said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. But when they came up from Egypt, Israel went through wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Israel then sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen. And they sent also to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained at Kadesh. Then they journeyed through the wilderness and went around the land of Edom and the land of Moab and arrived on the east side of the land of Moab and camped on the other side of the Arnon. But they did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was the boundary of Moab. And Israel sent, then sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, please let us pass through your land to our country. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people together and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. And the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. And they took possession of all the countries of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. So then the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Ammonites before his people Israel. And you are to take possession of them. Will you not possess Shemosh your God gives you to possess? And all that the Lord our God has dispossessed before us, we will possess? What's the story there? They wanted to pass through these lands. 
and the people in the lands would not let them pass through. So they were going around the lands, but yet the people got their armies together and said, let's attack them. And because they did that, then they fought back and they took the land. And they said, God has given it to us. It's not your land anymore. God has given it to us. And then he uses their God. He says, if, if Shemosh, your God, gives you land to possess, won't you possess it? Yes, would be the answer. And that's what they did. They took the land. We were going around you, but you came to attack us. So we defeated you. And to the victor goes the spoils. That's what happened. Now, are you any better than Balak, the sons of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever contend against Israel? Did he ever go to war with them? While Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages and in Arar and its villages and all the cities that are on the banks of the Anon, 300 years, why did you not deliver them within that time? What about the land you had before then? I therefore have not sinned against you, and you do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, the judge, decided this day between the people of Israel and the people of Amnon. God has decided this is our land. If they would realize that today, they maybe wouldn't have as much. Go ahead. Uh -huh. yeah, look at all the Bible knowledge that he uh -huh. has of, of his people. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just another point that says, you know, this wasn't no pagan man. This wasn't somebody who who had just abandoned God, he mm -hmm. clearly had a large knowledge of, of what had transpired in his history, and he's defending the children of Israel of, of, for owning that land and all the credit he's given to God. So mm -hmm. I, I think people who, who make out Jephthah to be a, you know, kind of a rash, bad judge, I, mm -hmm. I don't think they're really taking all this into consideration. Yeah. Because notice he didn't rush off the war and attack them. Mm -hmm. He's reasoning with them and trying to show them you got no basis for fighting. Mm -hmm. He's trying to avoid a war, not, yeah. not rashly go off and fight. That's it. We won this land fair and square. You know what that reminds me of? Uh, and, and Harry knows about this. When, when, when you have a prison ministry, many times you go to prison, and you'll be amazed how much Bible those people know. You'll be amazed. Well, we had a prison ministry at Archdale, and we went in there, and those people knew more Bible than what you would think. But yet they were in jail. Makes you wonder. But they still need the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. Uh, but the king of the Amorites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. Then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. The spirit of the Lord fell upon Jephthah. God uses who he will use. And he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mitzpah of Gilead. And from the Mitzpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Amorites. He was going through this country. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. His famous vow to the Lord. Why would he make a vow like that? Why do you think he'd make a vow? The first thing that comes out, I'll give to you. He's not sure of himself? I don't know. Maybe he's not sure that the Lord's with him, and he feels like he has to bargain with the Lord. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Anybody else? He does have an understanding at first. Mm-hmm. It's a gift first. It's a deep first. Okay. But I really agree with Mark there, where he's like, I was, and it's interesting you said mm -hmm. about the prison ministry, because that's, I was literally thinking about the people in the prison ministry. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of creepy. But uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's those who, who ended up on the wrong side of life or, or, or hard side of life, and, and, but they have an idea of God. Mm -hmm. and, and they make extreme vows, but they mm -hmm. say extreme things to try to seal that relationship that they're trying to get with God. Mm -hmm. And I think Jethro just has an idea of that he should make offerings, mm -hmm. but he, he's not the priest at that time, yeah. he's not the royal priest at that time, so mm -hmm. he's kind of misguided in terms of while, while studying this, and we've got to stop because it's, all, it's a minute before six, one person wrote that because of the upbringing that they had and the intermingling of the different faiths, 
you, you know that God didn't approve of, of human sacrifice, but he approved of animal sacrifice. But the other uh, faiths or religions ap approved of human sacrifice. And maybe because he'd grown up that way, he intermingled those. And he said, I've got to make some type of agreement with God to, show, to, to, to weld the fact that I'll get this victory. And maybe it's the fact, again, because he'd grown up in an atmosphere of intermingling of faiths when you have to keep those faiths separate. And we'll talk about it a little bit more because this is really gets interesting when we talk about what he had to do and what his daughter had to do. Okay? Will you bow with me? Our Father and our God, we are so privileged to be able to have your word in our life and to allow that word to enlighten us as to how the people of old lived their lives and how they lived for you and how they did not live for you. And we pray that as we live our lives now that we will learn good examples to follow and bad examples to shun, that we will live our lives in such a way as we don't make vows to you that are not in keeping with your will and your way, and that will affect the lives of others. We thank you for tonight's study and for today's worship and every aspect of it, for the remembrances of Jesus Christ, for the giving of our means, and for the preaching of the word, and for the songs of, of, the songs of worship to you. May you be blessed by all that we've given you today, and may you allow us to continue our worship throughout this week to you. For life and worship is more than just coming together inside these four walls. It is a life of worship. Everything that we do, may it be a worship unto you, and may you be glorified. And through you being glorified, may you bless us. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.